This is the all new Athena Git SX1 Pro ECU. Behind me? Well, that is a 23 Husqvarna 125 TBI race bike. In today's video, we're gonna dyno this ECU, and then we'll discuss some of the new features that have come out with it, what we can do with the ECU, and why it's gonna be important that you have something like this or this for your race bike. I'm Derek Harris here at HP Race Development. Let's get to it. In front of us, we have the new SX1 Pro two-stroke on the left, that RX1 Pro was on the right. Here you can get a nice, clean look at it. It's a little bit bigger unit for this new two-stroke than we've had in the past, but we're packing in a lot more horsepower on the inside of it. So this is gonna be the platform for these new two-strokes moving forward for 24. Let's test this stock EC real quick, green and white maps. show you just how easy it is. This is right out of the box. It'll come supplied to you like this with our preset maps. And all you gotta do is take the sheet off, unclip the stock ECU, pull off it with the rubber, take the seat bolt out, pull the sheet off. So it's clicked in like that. You push down on that, push your connector down, boom. Oh yeah, the ECU comes out. We've already got a rubber on. Safety first. Slide it in. Boom, positive lock, that's installed. You just reinstall your little rubber uh, tangs into that. ECU sits nice down and flat. You're gonna have two accessory wires here on the kit. These are so we can program it, and additionally so that we can have accessories down the road for you guys that we can offer all sorts of cool stuff coming down the road for both the four stroke and two stroke models. Just tuck those in, they don't have to be covered up or anything, just out of the way where your seat does not pinch them. That's very important, you don't wanna ruin them. I love this new seat design from KTM and Husqvarna. Down, back, and positively installed. Get your eight, get your T-handle. Seat back on. Now the $64,000 question we always get, well, Derek, do I have to do anything else? Well, if we set your bike up right, and you haven't screwed your bike up yet by totally ruining your TPS settings, it should fire right up. Luckily for you guys, we have a zero TPS procedure that if it is way off, you can do that, but that's for another video. So, let's see if she runs. guys let's get to the magic here is the dyno chart of this husky right here it's got all the updates it's got the latest and greatest uh in here with the rpm pickup not really sure if that mattered but ktm husky are smart so sometimes there's problems there we've got the latest ecu stock map uh, i'm sure that changes every single month but this one was done within the month so this bike is all updated and it runs like garbage makes about 27 horsepower that's on the green map let's add this uh white map real quick right here. So you can see the white map ran a little bit better on this particular bike, um, just a little bit. Never really sounded good, and, you know, you can kind of feel it come on and then it just, you can feel it flatten out. Let's add the torque in here so you can see that really quickly. Um, oops, I'm an idiot. Graph type, let's add in this uh, torque. And I wanna note something to you guys. So here's a torque, it's just shy of 15, it's 15 foot pounds right here. And guess what? That's about what these bikes make at peak torque. So when you ride it, it doesn't feel horrible because down here it pulls about right. It just never really makes horsepower. And then it revs okay and it, you know, it revs and runs. And so it's not like you ride it and you go, man, this thing's really bad. You just go, well, it's not good. And then you chalk that up to being this new bike and yada, yada, yada. So it doesn't run good though. Let's show you what a correct running stock bike. And I say correct, this is the best running one of these that I have dynoed yet. So it is uh, the absolute pinnacle of what you might purchase if you get a fuel injected 
TBI bike, and that's here in green. Now, obviously, way better, but you can see it's the same here and the same here, but as it comes into what we'd call the power band, it's 3342 versus 2579 right there. Um, that is eight horsepower. That's huge. And kids don't ride down here, and they don't ride out here that much. They do, but they don't. When they shift, it goes back. So this bike would be way better than this bike. So what's going on here? Well, this is what's been frustrating about these EFI TBI bikes. Some run good, some run bad. The vast majority that we've had come through the shop run more like this bike. I've had a host of them. Now, some of them make closer to 30 horsepower, but none of them generally run as good as this bike here. And this bike runs really good for a stock one. Now, let's add in our Git. So um, that looks like this. So this is the get on the bike here today, and boom. So we're still making power and very good gains over the perfect running stock bike. I mean, we're up two solid horsepower everywhere, way more over rev, runs way better. But compared to today's bike, right, compared to what we just started out with, I mean, look at that. We picked up tremendous horsepower. So if you happen to have one of these, you've been underwhelmed with it, doesn't run great, well, we've got a solution for you. And the nice thing is this solution works on both bikes, whether you have one that runs pretty good or you have one that runs pretty bad. This ECU made both of these bikes run good. That other bike, we ran the same ECU on it and we got the same result, runs really, really good. Now, how does it compare to a carbureted bike? Well, I happen to have dynoed a whole boatload of carbureted bikes. And here is a full Lynx National Mod package. This is, a, I'm not going to comment whose bike it was, but um, it was the full-blown package. You spend the big bucks and you get the package, and it's here in this light green color. So as you can see, way better than the stock fuel-injected bike, which, of course, was turd. Um, let's add a good running, excuse me, let's add a good running, the good running stock bike that we had here. So here's the good running stock bike. So... Better front side, right? Worse in the back side, and then less peak horsepower. Okay, now that is that full length package. So the standard carbureted bikes, eh, they run in that realm, but not quite as good, right? Not quite right there, although not far off. And then what about versus the Git ECU? Well, we got that up there already, but let's pull off this one. So versus our Git carbureted bike, excuse me, our Git fuel injected bike, no mods, bone stock pipe, bone stock silencer versus Lynx carbureted bike, and there you go. So we've got more front side, a little bit more peak, and sign off just a tiny bit earlier around peak, and then very similar in over rep. Um, technically, this one would be a little bit quicker on track if you used it correctly, but if your kid rides out here all the time, both these bikes would be about identical. Guess what? Your kids ride out here all the time, so both those bikes would be about identical. Now, if you coach your kid up correctly, he'll ride like this, he'll ride on either side of the peak. That means he's got to shift on time. Shift on time, get the most out of your bike. Shift too late, never get the most out of your bike. You're over here, you go, eh, shift, eh, shift. Whereas if you shift here, you go up and it's way better. All right, that's it. There's the results. Let's get to a conclusion. All right, you guys got to see this bike on the dyno. And we wanted to touch base real quickly on you, with you guys on a couple things. Number one, running great, making huge performance gains, extremely happy about it. We've got various tune-ups in the works. We've got a couple already for different fuels, different heads, different pipes. And of course, we're working together with, we already have our, our in-house porting, head combination, ECU combination. We've got that package really well sorted out, but we're trying to expand that so that we have more options for more people with different pipes, different fuels, different configurations. So... We're gonna keep expanding that library. If you're a dealer and you would like to sell these, hit us up. We offer full dealer support programs. Um, we take all the hard work out of your hands, put it in ours, and then you just get to go sell what your customers want and demand, which is a higher performing bike. Made huge power on this bike. Uh, these things are a challenge. Nobody's really happy with them where they are stock, and most people are very unhappy with them even in modified stock form. So it's important that uh, we continue to improve the EFI on these bikes, and we think this is gonna be a huge step in the right direction. You have to have curb your expectations. So EFI will take a long time to become as good as it possibly can. So you might encounter weird things occasionally. It is what it is. As long as it's not incredibly detrimental, it just is how it goes, right? It's like saying, hey, you know, this carburetor runs 90% better than this other carburetor, but every once in a while it hiccups or does something. If you can live with that 10%, you just have to live with it. That 90% is worth it. So that's something to keep in mind about curbing your expectations. What's cool about these that is good for you guys on the consumer end? Well. 
Number one, they do have the ability to communicate with the Wi-Fi box and then be smartphone tuned. That means your, your smartphone, you can make it richer, leaner, more or less ignition, and uh, you can do so at throttle positions and RPMs. So if you're a shop, this allows you to fine tune on your end to suit your bike, your package, your track, your air, your local conditions in your manner. These already correct for altitude, they correct for temperature, they correct for uh, all those types of variables, coolant temperature and all that. Having said that, we have found that there's a little bit of variance day to day, location to location, air quality to air quality. So having that feature available to you is, is pretty big. We've got a map switch that'll be rolling out pretty soon, uh, a Git map switch, and it'll have all sorts of features on it. It's a really neat switch. And that's kind of neat about these new SX1s is they're a CAN bus ECU. So now you can have smart switches that can have multifunctions and do all sorts of stuff as opposed to just a on off switch. So that's that. Um, wanted to talk about concepts, EFI versus carburetor. Let's do a quick dive into it and then check back in a future video for a really deep dive on the subject. So how does a carburetor work? Well, it works on Bernoulli's principle, which means that if air velocity increases, the localized pressure around it decreases. Turns out that's an incredible concept for us for carburation. Why? Let's draw that out for you. So we have a float bowl down here at the bottom. It has gas in it. And then it actually has vent tubes, which are connected at the top of your carburetor. I'm just gonna draw a little line out to the top and we have atmosphere pressure and we have pressure, okay? So that's ambient pressure, that's exterior pressure that works on the float bowl in your carburetor. The carburetor has a tube, that tube goes up into our intake tract and then that goes to where the slide is at, right? We have our intake tract and we have a set of reeds and then we have our engine to the right. All right, let's take a quick look at that. So. We have gas in a float bowl. We have a tube, your main jet's connected here. You have a needle that goes in there. You have a pilot circuit and some air bleeds and stuff, but not important for this discussion. You have vent tubes that are connected to your carburetor. Those vent tubes go to the atmospheric pressure. That's just the ambient pressure around you. So how does your carburetor work? So what happens is when air moves across this little hole right here, if it's moving at anything faster than zero, it decreases the pressure around it. Kind of a neat concept. So if the air starts moving, that means that the pressure inside of right here is less than the pressure outside of this tube. And any time you have less pressure in here than you have right here, which is what the vent tube does, fuel will come out. It's like pushing it, you can almost look at it. It's sucking it, but it's also the atmosphere acting on your float bowl, right, and pushing the fuel out. And that's a really cool concept because that's how carburetors work. We just so happen that air already moving into our engine happens to allow us to have carburation. Really, really cool idea. So what happens there is if we have a pressure wave that looks like this, okay, that's what your needle is seeing where your main jet's at. It says, hey, oh, air starts moving, it picks up velocity, it drops off and it stops moving. Then guess what? The carburetor supplies fuel exactly like that. And then you can change the size of the jets and that changes how much exactly comes out. But this is the actual fuel. It's a little delayed because there's mass to the fuel and a delay time. And then it actually goes over when the air stops because there's mass and then it returns back to zero. And if you measured this, we can with a jet change the proportions, but essentially the fuel matches the air. So if we take the area under the curve, if this was zero, right? And we measure the area, the little discrepancy here is made up for by the discrepancy here, and these two have an equal area under the curve. How does the fuel injector work? Well, we have our tube, we have our reed, then our engine, we have our air filter, but then we put an injector in here, and it sprays fuel. Okay, so exact same diagram, except that's an injector. And the difference is that how we supply fuel is, and a fuel injector is under... 50, 55 PSI, whatever we want it to be. And when the injector said, hey, open up, bam, wide open, 100% fuel flow. So how we control fuel flow through an injector is by the time that we leave it open. So what that looks like is if we have our intake event, we're gonna have where we decide, which is part of our cool programming and features inside the Git, we are gonna have an injector that sprays wide open fuel for a very brief time. Okay, so there's two factors here to consider. Number one, here's our airflow demand. So what we want to do is match the area underneath this curve right here to the area of fuel that we supplied. This is layman terms. The amount of fuel that you burn is a lot less 
than the amount of air that you burn as a percentage of weight, but this concept applies pretty well, okay? So the area, if we measured the total area of this fuel injection squirt, needs to match the total area underneath this curve, just like the carburetor one did, except we do it much differently. They have different shapes of fueling, right? And then the other thing that we need to adjust just perfectly is where we place this fuel injection hump. So imagine if this was the beginning of it, right? This is where, oh, it just starts to flow and then it starts to taper off or the other way around, whatever you want. We need to say, when do we place this from the beginning of suction? So if this was the beginning of suction, how far do we place it? So for example, we could place it here, right? A lot further distance, or we could place it here in the middle, right? The same area, but we would be changing where that fuel has been injected into our flow path, right? So that is really important. Now, here's an even crazier concept for you. So this would be if you had one injector, but turns out these bikes have two injectors and they have two injectors for a very good reason. It's really hard to mix a large quantity of fuel like this in a little tiny window. The carburetor gets to do it over the entire time. And so all of the air gets to be mixed with fuel and very thoroughly mixed. When you do this, you're gonna have pockets of air that have too much fuel, and then you're gonna have pockets of air that have no fuel. And that's not good. So what did the manufacturers do to solve that problem? Well, they did it really simply. So we have our airflow demand, and instead of that huge hump, they take two injectors that are sized smaller than what one would do, and then they do, and you might spray them at the same time if you want, right? And you might just spray a hump that, and I'm just gonna draw this for you guys, that's to scale. We might draw, we might do it like this, okay? We have two injectors spraying, and the combined total of those two injectors is equal to one of these injectors here, all right? If you just stack this on top of each other, put it on top, it's the same amount. And then of course, if you're smart about it, you might stagger when you flow those two injectors so that now our airflow is more thoroughly mixed. So when you size an injector, it has a very unique challenge. If this happened to be idle airflow demand, and then we happen to have, so we need to have injectors that are small enough to inject fuel over a wide enough time that it still mixes with the air. And then we have to have wide open airflow demand. So let's say we had wide open. This is wide open airflow demand, right? Well, our injectors still need to be big enough over the course of two of them to supply what we would call enough fuel for them like this, okay? And this is actually not exactly accurate, but essentially this phase here would have to be enough to supply this entire airflow demand with the correct amount of fuel. So it's actually the challenge of injector sizing, right? We have to be able to idle, and then we have to be able to supply enough fuel at wide open power to match those demands. And that's another reason these bikes have two injectors. They use one injector at low RPMs and at idle and at lower throttle openings, and then they phase in both injectors together as RPMs and throttle position opens up. And that allows us to meet the demands of idle fuel and wide open fuel without having an injector that's so big that the air and the fuel don't mix. So we have to manage all of those strategies. We have to manage when the injector fires, when both of those injectors fire, how long they fire for individually, where they fire relative to the crank. Then of course, we also have to get the amount that they fire matched to the airflow demand that the engine has. And that's where the challenge of fuel injection lies. That's what's gonna be worked on for the next couple years of fuel injection in two strokes. And hopefully within my career, we get it to be better than what carburetors were. I don't know if that'll be the case or not because carburetors were pretty good. But on four strokes, we've gotten fuel injection to be really good. And that's because we've manipulated all of those factors to maximize performance of our engines. The same will apply to these two strokes. And as we learn more and more and more and apply unique technologies and concepts to them, they will continue to get better. But believing that by adding fuel injection to our bike, we're gonna magically make it better than a carbureted bike, which a lot of the magazine outlets went out there and told you is really naive and frankly, ignorant or stupid. Just because you change how the fuel is delivered does not mean you change how a two-stroke engine works. It still has a pipe. It still is a two-stroke. It still has port timings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the engine design has hardly changed from this engine to the previous carbureted engine. Same bike. All right, check back for a more in-depth video on fuel injection on a two-stroke. We'll get really serious about it. If you're into that kind of stuff, check back, like, subscribe. I'll see you guys next time.